Welcome back to AP World History. We're going to take a look at the Industrial Revolution now, and we're going to start by looking at what happens in Britain, and then how that, what happens in Britain spreads to the rest of uh, Europe. And so, to start with, we got to think about, well, what, what caused this Industrial Revolution to happen, and why? Why is it in Britain and in Europe instead of somewhere like China, India, or the Ottoman Empire? And the first thing is, one are the, the rivalries that they have. Um, the European states are still divided and they all want to one-up each other and so this leads Britain to, uh, or all of them to, to be, really push themselves to innovate and, and Britain will be the first one that really kicks this off and, and starts the revolution. Um, also their governments support business unlike what we see in um, some other regions like China where business isn't the most important thing and more it's about farmers. And so to support businesses they give them tax breaks and allow for monopolies like with the East India companies. And then um, you have Europe becoming a center for global trade. One, they're the center of trade in the Atlantic world, but they're becoming more and more of a power in the Indian Ocean trade. They still aren't that yet. They will be that after the Industrial Revolution, but they're not a dominant force until after this revolution. And then they have the natural resources that you have to have to do this. You need especially coal and iron. Coal because that's your main power source and iron because it's the main material that you're going to make things out of, which will eventually become steel when you purify iron enough. And then uh, Britain and Europe have a surplus of labor. They have a larger and larger population from the um, Columbian Exchange, and they've sent some to be settlers in their colonies, but that's not enough, and so they need to find some new things for people to do because their cities are growing, and with that... Um, Less they're able to become farmers because you can only divide up the land so much. And with new technology and farming, they don't need as many workers on the land. And so all these uh, factors will coalesce into creating the Industrial Revolution. And what that is, is it's a transition from um, kind of home-based uh, manufacture of goods where you might make your own shirt or your family might make its own shirt and you might have a couple shirts to where now you have a a, a group of people working in a factory creating it, uh, working all together on an, uh, uh, what will eventually later become a, an assembly line, or just working in, in unison on making these uh, products, whether it's uh, yarn or, or uh, weaving into the yarn into textiles or whatever it may be. And so um, these factories will be originally powered by water, and then later they'll be powered by the steam engine and coal. And this whole process begins around 1760, and it will last until 1840. Um, and then we'll have a second Industrial Revolution happen later in the um, 19th century, going into the 20th century. And then um, some people will say we're out of the industrialization today. Others will say it's still going on. Uh, and so that's still kind of remained to be seen, in my opinion, uh, because we are still uh, innovating on uh, what we developed there or began to develop at this time. And so... Uh, only time will tell whether it ended there or it's still going today. Now, some key inventions here that you should know about from this revolution are uh, the spinning jenny, uh, which is really the first uh, machine that allows for the factory production that we get into. Uh, and that's pictured up here in the top right. Uh, but what that allows you to do is take cotton and weave it into, or not weave it, but spin it into uh, yarn to be able to use or... Um, or, um, yeah, we'll just go with the yarn, um, although that's probably not the right term. And then you have the power loom, which then takes that yarn or thread, thread's what I was looking for, and takes that thread and weaves it into a textile, so then you can make clothing and whatever else you want to make out of that textile. Uh, later on, the steam engine becomes a major power source, but it was first used to pump out the wells uh, because people were digging deeper and deeper and deeper for coal and iron. And when you get deep enough, you get to the water table where there's water there, and you got to pump that out of the well. And so that's what that's originally used for, but then they find out they can use it to turn the factories, and then we have factories being based on that and being built anywhere and not just being built along the river. Along with this process of uh, creating the steam engine, we have the process of creating new steel um, uh, that makes it more affordable, cheaper, and a lot easier to make through the Bessemer steel process. And then... That steel process allows us to make um, steel much cheaper and allow it to be used to lay down tracks and then also create rail, or rail cars that can then um, transport goods a lot faster than uh, mules and horses and oxen and anything else that might have been 
any other pack animal that might be um, using that. And it also allows for faster travel of people. And then the last kind of major invention here is the telegraph, uh, which allows for in almost instant communication. Now, it's a little different than talking through the phone like we do today. You've got to know Morse code, but you have that uh, instant communication that you can reach and, and send news around uh, the country quickly or even around the world once uh, telegraph lines are set up. And all of this will coalesce into uh, creating an increased supply of goods and lowering the cost of goods, which allows people to benefit from that. Now, how much they benefit from that depends on their class and, and their social standing, which is now what we're going to take a look at. And uh, we're going to dive into the different classes that develop uh, from this time period. So um, starting off, we're going to look at the middle and upper classes. Um, this is actually the first time in, in, in history where we really start to have a true middle class developing um, that will actually have kind of a power and say and be of a sizable portion of the population. Um, and so the middle class are, are mainly the business owners, they're the professionals, and they're the non-manual laborers, so you can think of like lawyers, teachers, those types of people. And they are educated. That is the key factor here. They're, they're educated. Um, and they're making, uh, if they're the business owner, if they have a successful one, they're going to be making lots and lots of money during this time and could reach the upper class levels. Uh, however, at this time, or later they will reach that, at this time the upper class are the aristocratic families that have owned land for generations, have had a stockpile of wealth for generations, um, some of them are becoming businessmen, um, and uh, others are like the super wealthy businessmen like an Andrew Carnegie who really comes out later. Um, in the second industrial revolution, but um, people like that, that uh, have these super wealthy businesses become what might be equivalent today as being billionaires. And the aristocratic families, at least, are also a major part of the government. Uh, and sometimes those wealthy business owners will make their way into government as well. While the middle class are still kind of kept out of it because they don't have enough money, even though they're educated and, and kind of know what's going on, which leads us to those revolutions that we had. Now, the lower classes, the lower groups, uh, the lower class is going to be the toughest situation that you're in. Um, and they do all the manual work. Uh, and uh, this is a tough work in the factories. It's not easy. It's really boring and tedious. Uh, and it's dangerous. Um, if you fall asleep for a second or doze off uh, when you're trying to work at your machine, you might get your hand caught or some other uh, appendage caught. And that can cause some major issues. And so you can see in the picture top left here, <coughs> excuse me, of um, some students that or some kids that have been maimed in their um, in their line of work. And then below them, you can see um, some child laborers that worked in the coal mines. And so um, <coughs> child labor is a major issue for these families. Uh, but unfortunately, these lower class families have to have their kids go and work because that's the only way they're scra scraping them enough of money. Uh, the, the husband will work, uh, women will also work, um, and so everyone's working to try to scrape by because wages are really low. The, the middle class and upper class will, will get, make a lot out of this, but they, they keep the wages of the poor low, and uh, there is no minimum wage at the time, so sometimes people are making just pennies a week. Um, and because of this, their houses aren't that great, they don't have great sanitation, uh, they're in the city, they're in the worst areas of the city, and so um, it's a really not glamorous life, um, as you can probably imagine. Um, and then for women, uh, it even is kind of a little bit tougher at times in that there are no really specific rights for women. Um, you were expected to work until you were married. Uh, middle class women usually worked as secretaries or teachers. Um, and then lower class ladies worked in the textile factories. And sometimes this would continue after they're married if the family still needs the money. Otherwise, they might not, and they might run the household or the tenement that they're living in um, and trying to keep that clean and, and together. Uh, but at times, they would also go back and work in those factories if that was necessary. And in these jobs, they were not paid equally. Men were, men, adult men were paid the most, and then the women and then the children were paid the lowest wages. <coughs> Now, because of these conditions, people get upset and they think, well, life shouldn't have to be this way. And really, should life be that way? No. You can see in our world that we live in today that, it, that it's not that way. And so some of these things that happen, like uh, protests against wage labor, 
or the wages and uh, hours worked and things like that uh, come from this time period. So like the standard eight hour work day comes from the Industrial Revolution and the, the protests, the labor movements that come out of that. And uh, they eventually come about because workers will create unions, which are groups that come together to uh, protect workers. And they will fight for better wages and conditions, and the business owners absolutely hate these people. Uh, however, uh, the governments will eventually step in and protect them, and uh, will start to stand up for them at times, especially in Britain with the Labour Party. And what these unions will do is they will protest and strike the business to get those better conditions, whether it's safer conditions, whether it's less hours, whether it's higher wages, or a combination of all those. <coughs> and they will threaten with destroying the machines, or actually going and destroying the machines, um, to keep them from uh, firing more people, because machines will um, make some workers obsolete. Uh, they will also barricade the factories to keep anyone from getting in there, because as soon as workers went on protest, uh, businesses would hire in new people, because there are plenty of people that need a job. They'll bring in new people right away that they called scabs, um, and kick those old people right out of their job. Um, or they'd work until they came back if they wanted to have some of those people back. Um, but for the most part, people got uh, fired for striking. And um, these were a lot of times illegal uh, early on, and so there would be uh, suppression by the government, one, and also by the businesses that would hire um, companies to come in and beat up the uh, protesters and the strikers to get them in line and get them back to work or get them moving on. Now, this is much different from today where, for the most part, you can strike if you want to strike. <clears throat> there are some laws and regulations against it, um, but you're allowed to protest and, and get better conditions, and also the government's there to protect you from having absolutely terrible working conditions. Now, the last thing we'll talk about in this um, bit right here is going to be the two economic systems that develop from this Industrial Revolution. The first actually comes out of the Enlightenment and is capitalism, and that is by a guy named Adam Smith. And his ideas really lead to the Industrial Revolution in that the government should really let businesses do what they want to do and let them regulate themselves and let the economy do what it needs to do, and the government just needs to stay out because they cause more problems than anything else. And so what we call this is laissez-faire. And <coughs> that gets everything set up. Um, they also, he also calls for a social, social, social democracy where um, it's a reformed government. People have a, a part in the government, so they get a vote, they get to participate. So we have Republican style of governments. Uh, this will lead to the Labor Party in Britain that will uh, protect workers' rights and protect uh, the lower classes. Um, it will also lead to governments reforming and creating a, or reforming themselves, but also reforming businesses and creating regu regulations for work days, child labor, minimum wages will eventually come from this, and they will fight to fix the sanitary conditions. Um, so that's what kind of comes down with Adam Smith's, or through Adam Smith's idea of capitalism. It's not all in his book because he didn't see all this coming, per se, but this eventually comes out of it. And this is supposed to help fix those problems, especially when the government starts reforming things and keep what Karl Marx says will happen with communism uh, from happening. And so Karl Marx uh, looks at the Industrial Revolution and absolutely despises it. He says, this is the worst thing ever. It's keeping people down. It's, a, it's really a class division type thing. The poor are working in terrible conditions, and it's just awful. And so... He argues that, you know what, there needs to be a violent revolution that, that really upends everything. And to do this, the poor need to rise up and um, really fix things. They need to get rid of the rich people, whether that's killing them or just getting rid of them and pushing them out. And they need to seize all their property and all their wealth and then distribute it, e distribute it equally among everyone else. And then with that, they can start a new society where everyone is equal no one is above each other. The government will be there initially, but the government will eventually disappear because you won't need government to regulate people when people do things for each other. And then everything will be shared. So all the wealth will be shared, 
and everyone will get what they need, not necessarily what they want or deserve. And so if you have 10 kids and you're a janitor, you're going to get more money and wages to support that whole family than a business owner or a manager with a wife and one kid. <coughs> now, we might not view that as the most fair thing, but in the eyes of communism where it's about assessing your needs and, and, and fulfilling those needs, it is very much a fair thing for that to happen. Uh, however, with U.S. culture, and we'll take a look at that with uh, how they react to socialism and communism here with this, um, there's a much different reaction, as you can imagine here in the U.S. And so this kind of wraps up this first part here with the um, Europe. It starts in Europe because of those rivalries again, um, and they bring in new industrial technologies uh, with new types of machines to use, like the spinning jenny and the steam engine, which lead to more people being able to get jobs and faster production of items, but at the same time, it really keeps the uh, lower classes down and keeps them from um, living very meaningful and purposeful lives. Instead, they are just kind of ground um, or worked to death in, in some cases uh, from very long work days and poor working conditions. Uh, which led us to these reforms here uh, in reforming the laissez-faire economy to having some regulations in the capitalist view of things and then the idea that we should overthrow all of government and, and set up a new economy within Karl Marx's communism ideals. <clears throat>